Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm sorry that we can't be meeting in Vatican City, but uh, I guess this is the next best thing. Um, this paper is an occasional paper. It's been written for the purpose of this conference, and uh, it's a little different from some of what it's both very much the same kind of thing I do and in some respects a little bit different. So let me begin. There's no communication, only mediation. This paper is something of a polemic coupled with a thought experiment. As a polemic, it puts forth an argument against thinking of our digital media environment primarily on a model of communication. To frame today's session as taking up changing patterns of communication, for example, risks considering digital media along the lines of representation rather than mediation. If we are to make sense of changing media in a changing world, as the webinar conference invites us to do, we'd be better off thinking about changing patterns of mediation rather than of communication. Put differently, we'd be better off thinking about what digital media do to humans and non-humans or how they mediate than about the content of what they communicate. By focusing on questions of veracity or intemperate speech, on the content of our changing media rather than their socio-technical forms and practices, we risk losing sight of what is truly changed in our patterns of communication and mediation and what is truly dangerous about them. In an era of data, machine learning, and algorithmic-driven social media, e-commerce, and surveillance, Communication occurs through complex mediations of human and non-human networks and technologies. Focusing our attention primarily on false truths, false news, lies, contradictions, alternative facts, risks ignoring what I've called, following Matthew Fuller and Andrew Goffey, the evil mediation performed by socio-technical formats, politics, and practices. As a thought experiment, this talk attempts some preliminary testing of different concepts of mediation. More specifically, it asks what might happen if we were to consider the concept of mediation in Catholic thought in relation to some of my own theoretical work in media theory. I've been thinking and writing about the concept of mediation in Western thought for more than 25 years, particularly but not exclusively in relation to what's been understood since the 1980s as the digital revolution. And what today compels our attention in the forms and practices of social media, e-commerce and global surveillance. My hope in performing this modest thought experiment is to see what kind of results we might obtain by putting these two different accounts of mediation in relation to one another. I attempt to discover if thinking and writing about mediation and media theory can perhaps shed any even faint light on how mediation has been traditionally understood and applied in Catholic thought and practice. And then the reverse as well. The title of my talk alludes to a 1997 interview between Bruno Latour and Geert Lovink entitled, There Is No Information, Only Transformation. In this interview, Latour argues <clears throat> that the notion, <clears throat> excuse me, that the notion of digital information as an autonomous entity that can be carried through space and time without deformation is a complete myth because information is not abstract, but always manifests through forms and practices of socio-technical mediation. There can be, Latour contends, no information that is not transformed by technical mediation. In distinguishing between information and transformation, Latour restates a distinction more fundamental to his thinking that between intermediaries and mediators, in which mediators are not neutral means of transmission, but actively involved in transforming whatever they mediate. To think of our changing media as intermediaries is to take the focus away from the specificity and materiality of mediation. 
and to place it on the elements of our changing world that these intermediaries present. In other words, to focus on them as uh, forms of communication rather than mediation. To think, however, of our changing media as mediators, or as Latour also calls them mediations, is to focus instead on the translations or transformations effected by these media themselves. In the context of this conference, this webinar, my talk could be thought of as an exercise in mediation theology, not to be confused with, although not unrelated to, the Vermittlungstheologie theology of early 19th century German idealism. The initial doctrine of my mediation theology was remediation, which I began developing with J. David Bolter in 1996. Remediation challenged hyperbolic cyber utopian, cyber -utopian claims about the unprecedented character of new digital media. All media we insisted remediate prior forms and practices of media. What seems so radically different about new media in the 1980s and 1990s, we argued, was their radical remediation of other earlier media forms, print, television, photography, etc. Remediation operates according to a double logic of immediacy and hypermediacy, sinking, seeking simultaneously to erase and to proliferate forms and practices of mediation. Our more formal epistemological description of remediation is entangled with an emphasis on the ontological and experiential aspect of mediation, on what mediation does. This aspect is evident in our three corollaries of remediation, that all mediation is remediation, that mediation is inseparable from the real, and that remediation is reform. Mediations are real, we wrote in 1999, not only because the objects produced, photos, videos, films, paintings, CD-ROMs, etc., circulate in the real world, but also because the act of mediation itself functions as a Latourian hybrid and is treated much like a physical object. This focus on how media operate and what mediation does also informs the second doctrine of my mediation theology, pre-mediation, which maintains that digital media operate to pre-mediate potential futures before they arrive, even if, as most often happens, these futures fail to occur as anticipated. That is, there are in almost infinitely more pre-mediations of the future than there are futures. Premediation, I argued, intensified in response to the worldwide media trauma of 9-11 as a collective effort to prepare the global media public in the event of similar unexpected catastrophes. In developing this concept, I sought to explain how premediation mobilized and modulated individual and collective moods or structures of feeling. I distinguished premediation from prediction in that premediation is less concerned with accuracy, with getting the future right, but more with mobilizing and controlling individual and collective affectivity or moods in the present in order to prepare for potential futures that might materialize. As I did in regard to remediation, I focused my thinking about premediation on the affectivity and materiality of media not what media represent or communicate. More recently, I've developed the doctrine of radical mediation, which challenges the philosophical dualism that underlies most models of representation and communication. Radical mediation takes direct aim at the fundamental ontological distinction between mediation and immediacy that has predominated in Western philosophical and theological thought, at least since Hegel. In theorizing radical mediation, I argue that we should consider mediation not as a secondary or tertiary phenomenon, but as a place to begin. We should attend to the immediate affective experience 
of mediation itself. In suggesting that mediation is immediate, I swim against a strong Hegelian current running through the history of Western thought, which categorically distinguishes mediation from immediacy. In fact, for Hegel, because we cannot have an immediate relation with God, with spirit, with the world, mediation uh, is necessary to connect us with these objects. In challenging the fundamental distinction between mediation and immediacy, my concept of radical mediation continues to develop the line of thought I began following in my earlier work. But how you're probably wondering by now, does this rethinking of mediation relate to the topic of today's session or to the conference more generally? To begin answering this question, <clears throat> I wanna first turn to a December 2016 morning meditation by Pope Francis in the chapel of the Domus Sancti Marti, in which the Pope takes up the distinction between intermediaries and mediators, advocating that priests take the path of the mediator over the more functionary role of the intermediary. The intermediary, Pope Francis says, only does his job. He does things more or less well and then finishes that job and takes another, another, and another, but always as a functionary. The mediator, on the other hand, forfeits himself in order to unite the parties, giving his life himself, that is the price. His actual life, he pays with his life, his weariness, his work, many things. The distinction that Pope Francis makes in this morning meditation resembles Latour's invidious distinction between passive intermediaries and active mediators. But it's not clear to what extent this preference for authentic mediators over functionary intermediaries departs from a post-Hegelian understanding of mediation as standing between individual believers and the immediacy of God. So there are affinities with Latour's important distinction, but not clear if they are the same. Pope Francis relies in his morning meditation on the biblical understanding of Jesus as the mediator between God and man as expressed most explicitly in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. In presenting Jesus as the one mediator between God and man, Paul's letter to Timothy appears to suggest <clears throat> that Jesus comes between God and man in an almost secondary or dependent position. But elsewhere, Paul offers a different account of Jesus's mediation, which presents him as what I would call a radical mediator, whose mediation is ontogenetic, generative of the relation between God and man, rather than in any sense secondary to or derivative of that relation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm referring here to Paul's characterization of Jesus in Colossians 1, 15, 20, as the firstborn of all creation, before all things, and in whom all things hold together. This passage puts Jesus's mediation not between God and man in a secondary role, but at the beginning of all creation. A similar account of Jesus is what I would call a radical mediator recurs at least three times in Revelation, where he proclaims himself to be the arche and the telos, the origin and end of the world. First, there's Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 21.6 presents Jesus as a radical mediator as well. Then he said to me, it is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. And finally, in Revelation 22, 13, Jesus says succinctly, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In all of these passages, Jesus's mediation is presented as encompassing the world from Arche to Talos, as that from which the world emerges prior to and independent of its origins, not something or that which emerges after the world has already begun. I juxtapose, and just to say, I know that there is a really deep and extensive theological work on these questions, and I'm not trying to intervene in the theological understanding of Jesus's mediation as much as to think about a parallel between these accounts and the two accounts of mediation I've seen in Western thought. So I juxtapose these descriptions of Jesus as Alpha and Omega with one Timothy's description of him as a mediator between God and man to suggest that the New Testament may, pres may present two not entirely compatible accounts of Jesus's mediation. One account is exemplified in Pope Francis' morning meditation, imagines Christ's or the priest's mediation as coming between God and man, as communicating the truth of God to man. The other imagines the mediation of Jesus not as subsequent to or mediating between a pre-existent relation between God and man, but as generative of that relation. As Alpha and Omega, the radical mediation of Jesus brings the relation of God and man into being, generating, not transmitting the truth of God. What interests me about the possibility that the Bible contains, excuse me, these two different accounts of mediation is that they seem of a piece with the two conflicting accounts of mediation I've been tracing out in Western thought. What has become increasingly apparent in the first decades of the 21st century I have written elsewhere is that these new technical media are not secondary concepts, agents, or apparatuses that come between or connect extant subjects and objects, cultures and natures, bodies and environments, or humans and non-humans. Rather, like radical mediation itself, these new formations of technical media produce the mediations through which such oppositions and more radically such multiplicities are generated in continuous but by no means seamless feedback loops. So now let me bring this back to the subject of our webinar. The aim of my work along with that of some of my fellow speakers has been to encourage scholars, practitioners and users of digital media to shift their focus to what technical forms and practices of mediation do how they operate socially, politically, economically, or even spiritually, rather than overemphasizing the representational content of these media. In doing so, I've hoped in my- Two minutes work, more, two minutes. Two yeah, minutes I'm, more. I'm fine. I've hoped to convince scholars of media and communication that the challenges posed by changing media in our changing world are best addressed, not by thinking of them as intermediary communications, but by thinking of mediation as an active agent of material effective and spiritual transformation. I wanna close my remarks today by bringing to bear some of the speculations on the concerns of today's session. The concept note for the session ends by posing three questions. Can skim reading, which in the digital age has become the new normal, allow us to grasp complexity? Does digital media's colonization of our time leave space for contemplation and intimacy? Does the dissemination of information still allow fact-checking and in-depth studying that can evolve into knowledge and then become wisdom? These are of course important questions, but their focus on human concerns is both the beginning and end of the problems posed by changing patterns of communication leaves out the material and non-human agency of mediation that I've been urging us to engage. 
Each of these questions assumes a historical drama or of a fall from grace, from a more perfect world of communication in which earlier highly valued forms of human attention and relation are threatened or destroyed by the development of new technologies. Even further, these earlier forms of being human are taken as somehow normal or given rather than seen as themselves emerging in collaboration with earlier technologies. Complex reading, for example, is seen to be threatened <clears throat> by overwhelming quantities of mediated digital data. Contemplation and intimacy risk colonization by digital media. Fact-checking and in-depth studying, which evolve into knowledge and wisdom, are disabled by new patterns of information dissemination. In each case, however, values like complexity, contemplation, and wisdom are presented as unexamined, almost universal goods, rather than as forms of cognition that have been entrained by earlier historical media like print or painting. Instead of bemoaning the loss of these cognitive practices and patterns, perhaps we might instead ask whether complexity, contemplation, and wisdom, for example, are necessarily the best form of human thinking for our new media environment. By refocusing our concerns on the forms and practices of mediation as ontogenetic or technogenetic, rather than as intermediaries communicating between already pre-existent actants and entities, we will, I think, be in a much better position to make sense of and to transform the ongoing relations between changing media and our changing world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your contribution.